in 2011, uh, Michael Platt, who was then the director of the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, and I were asked to supply letters on whether we would like to work with Dr. Ralph Severis, professor of English at Grinnell College, if he were to be awarded a Mellon Humanities Writ Large Fellowship. We read his materials and we were like, yes, yes, we would. And in 2012, Ralph arrived in our midst, and I can honestly say that we've never been quite the same at Duke since Ralph was here. So to hearken back to Nick Susanis' talk on not just sticking with the conventional literacies, I think Ralph's work at the crossroads of neuroscience, literature, and social justice unflattened our understanding. Ralph is the author of the 2007 Reasonable People, a memoir of autism and adoption, and now of the book he was writing during his time here as a fellow, See It Feelingly, Classic Novels, Autistic Readers, and the Schooling of a No Good English Professor with Duke University Press. Poet and Guggenheim Foundation President Ed Hirsch has said of the book, this deft and impassioned hybrid part memoir, part disability study, part portraiture, uh, uh, part literary criticism, is a book of revelations about reading, neurodiversity, and American literature. He wrote, I was repeatedly startled by its slow cascade of correctives and insights, deepened, widened, and enlarged. It is a necessary book. Uh, in his teaching, Ralph's courses run the gamut from American literature to disability studies, from medical humanities to creative writing. And I can really attest to the creativity and the almost anachronistic rigor uh, of his pedagogy, um, not least because I had the privilege of co-teaching with him, uh, both in the Flaubert's Brain course and in a course for psychiatry residents at Duke, Languages of Trauma. Uh, but it's in this new book that we truly see the discovery zone for Ralph and for those who accompany him in reading and writing of pedagogy. Ralph can make more things happen with poetry and from poetry than any scholar I know. Just listen to the innovative resonance of his article titles, The Lobes of Autobiography, Poetry and Autism. I love that, The Lobes of Autobiography. Uh, Ralph is the co-editor of Papa PhD, Men in the Academy Write About Fatherhood. He is also the co-editor of a special issue of Disability Studies Quarterly entitled Autism and the Concept of Neurodiversity, uh, and of a special issue of the Seneca Review entitled The Lyrical Body. He's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Irene Glasscock National Undergraduate Poetry Competition, the Hennig Cohen Prize from the Herman Melville Society for an Outstanding Contribution to Melville Scholarship, an Independent Publishers Gold Medal for Reasonable People in the category of Health and Medicine, two notable essay distinctions in the Best American Essay Series, two Pushcart Prize nominations, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Fellowship. His articles have been published in an extraordinary array of, of journals, uh, including American Literature, American Poetry Review, Disability Studies Quart Quarterly, The Ethics of Neurodiversity, uh, fourth Genre, Frontiers of Integrative Neuroscience, uh, Leviathan, a journal of Melville Studies, the New England Review, Oxford Handbook of Cognitive Literary Studies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In any case, it is just an enormous privilege to welcome such an innovative and profound thinker uh, in our midst to present uh, this really huge achievement, which is your new book. So welcome. One of the classic novels that I discuss with an autistic reader is Herman Melville's Moby Dick. My book's title, See It Feelingly, obviously comes from Shakespeare's King Lear. In Act 4, Scene 6, the Earl of Gloucester, whose eyes have been gouged out, begs to be led to the cliffs of Dover so that he may jump off and kill himself. While on the heath, he runs into Lear, who foolishly bequeathed 
his kingdom to his conniving daughters and is himself plunged into madness. As Lear decries the failure of ordinary sight to uncover ruthless deception, Gloucester invokes a different and in the end superior kind of vision. Your eyes are in a heavy case, your purse in a light, and yet you see how this world goes, the king says. I see it feelingly, Gloucester replies. I use this line, I'm going to give you a very crude summary of the book, again, for context. I use this line to suggest the nature of literature's hold on us. When we read a novel, as scientists and cognitive literary scholars have demonstrated, we see it feelingly. We produce that is sensuous mental imagery in our heads, visual imagery, auditory imagery, tactile imagery, motor imagery, even at least for some of us, um, gustatory and olfactory imagery. And this imagery is bathed in emotion. As the great Italian neuroscientist Vittorio Galisi has written, visual imagery is somehow equivalent to an actual visual experience, and motor imagery is also somehow equivalent to an actual motor experience. You might even think of literature as a verbal cinema of emotion, a kind of old-fashioned movie house in which neither a projector nor a screen is necessary. It's all internal. But autism and literature, for decades, the prevailing view was that autism's triad of impairments in communication, imagination, and social interaction made literature, especially fiction, too difficult to understand too difficult to understand and too alien to relate to or invest in. Literature, after all, depended on things like figurative language and complex theory of mind, things that autistics were said to be bad at. With the rise of the neurodiversity movement, however, and a new emphasis on difference, not deficits, old truths have fallen away and a new portrait of autism has emerged. That new portrait leans heavily on the sensory aspects of autism, the way that autistics, as Donna Williams once put it, live in the sensory. They are generally bottom-up, whereas neurotypicals are generally top-down thinkers. Autistics disproportionately rely on sensory cortices in the back of the brain, and they sometimes have trouble subordinating low-level perceptual input to abstract concepts. In the introduction to See It Feelingly, I note that Temple Grandin's famous phrase, Thinking in Pictures, it's the title of one of her books, lines up nicely with what literature asks us to do. So let me take a second before turning to my lecture to introduce the autistic collaborators in the book, there they are on the screen, and to tell you what I read with each of them. They couldn't be more different from one another. So I adopted my son DJ from foster care when he was six years old. He was in diapers, didn't speak, and had been labeled profoundly retarded. In May of 2017, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Oberlin College as the institution's first non-speaking student with autism. This past year, Deej, the documentary that he starred in, wrote and co-produced, won a prestigious Peabody Award and was selected Best of Festival at the International Disability Film Festival. With DJ, I discussed Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Tito Raharshi Mukhopadhyay is also non-speaking, but unlike my son, he's never been allowed in a regular classroom. Emigrating from India at age 12, he was entirely homeschooled by his mother, first in LA and then in Austin, Texas. For the past decade, I've been meeting weekly with him by Skype to talk about fiction, poetry, and memoir. When we meet, I speak, and Tito uses the sidebar to type his comments. Undoubtedly, the world's most well-known non-speaking autist, someone who has compelled scientists to rethink claims of mental retardation in classical autism, Tito has authored five books, including How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? With Tito, I discussed Herman Melville's Moby Dick two chapters a week for 17 months. And I did that while I was at Duke on the fellowship that, that uh, Deborah was talking about. Jamie Burke, uh, you'll hear about him today, learned to speak at age 13, though he still prefers to type his deepest thoughts and then to read them aloud, especially when he is nervous. He and I were guests on a memorable Iowa public radio show do devoted to the burgeoning neurodiversity movement. The audience who'd been prepped beforehand heard the sound of fingers on a keyboard followed by Jamie's proud voice. Because he had minored in Native American studies at Syracuse University, 
You can see some of his native-inspired art on the screen. I chose Leslie Marmon Silco's seminal novel, Ceremony, which concerns a mixed-race Laguna Pueblo war veteran whose healing from PTSD comes about after he embraces long-neglected rituals. Dora Raymaker returned to school in her 40s and received her PhD in system science. While earning her doctorate, she co-founded Aspire, the Academic Autistic Spectrum Partnership in Research and Education, an organization devoted to the principle of community-based participatory research. Dora is currently the associate editor of a new journal, Autism in Adulthood. And long before she went to grad school, she was a computer coder she, she is complete dyscalculia. She can't deal with numbers, but she uses her very intense synesthesia to do her coding. Um, and there's some terrific stories that she tells in that chapter. With her, I read Philip K. Dick's sci-fi classic, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The novel hinges on the question of whether the replicants, who are said to lack empathy, um, are really less human than the empathy-challenged humans who hunt them. For years, of course, scientists have claimed that autistics lack empathy. A few months ago, Dora published her own sci-fi novel, Hoshi and the Red City Circuit, which features a sleuthing neurodivergent heroine. Eugenie Belkin is a multiracial autistic woman and the mother of an autistic child. She is also deaf. She uses a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid in another. A classically trained ballerina, she went completely deaf after the chicken pox at age 12. Um, Eugenie works as a choreographer for competitive ice skaters. With her, I discuss Carson McCullers' The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, which features a deaf protagonist named John Singer, who the other character is a labor activist, a black doctor, a closeted trans cafe owner, and a tomboy musician believed divines their thoughts. Uh, she loathed this book, could not have loathed it more. And, and really, the book needed someone, needed a lot of hate after, you know, some true cathecting with some of the, and it's hilarious, and she's right in, in, in many ways. Um, Temple Grandin needs no introduction. She is famous the world over for her innovations in livestock handling. She has authored many books and is the subject of a Golden Globe winning film. With Temple, I discussed two short stories from a recent anthology among animals, the lives of animals and humans in contemporary short fiction. In one, story titled Meat by C.S. Malarick, a man is appalled by the horrors of commercial livestock production and decides to humanely raise and kill the animals that his family eats. In another, titled The Ecstatic Cry by Midge Raymond, she is pictured above, a female biologist devotes herself to saving endangered penguins in Antarctica. In both stories, of course, complications arise. All right, now for Jamie. In a short essay from high school, Jamie Burke offered a whimsical approach to adversity. Struggles are the vegetables of life, he wrote. They do not appear the tastiest, but are necessary to attempt good health. With a flair for the figurative, he described both his sensory motor challenges and the therapies and accommodations that have allowed him to flourish. Take, for example, his sensitivity to smell and hearing. From the moment he began his inclusion journey as a young boy with classical autism, he dreaded the malodorous mosh pit of the cafeteria. He dreamt of lunch, quote, being served in a room far away from cooking so smells are not sickening. Lunch should be, quote, a time for peaceful eating and not loud talking and annoying bells and whistles which split my ears as a sword in use of killing monsters, end quote. My ears hear colossally well, he noted, so noise can be difficult. Anxiety could be difficult too, very difficult. It arrived, the burly six foot seven, Jamie said, quote, as a constant visitor, just as breathing. He believed his, quote, cells have a nucleus filled with it, end quote. Pacing offered some relief, but he felt as if a porcupine were constantly prodding his nerves. Sensory integration has been like a giant band-aid to my body, he reported. It wraps up the stingers as a ball of cotton and makes things more comfortable for me. Such therapy took many forms, either striving to subdue his overperforming senses or to draw out his underperforming ones, all the while working to blend them in a manner that neurotypicals take for granted. 
For instance, Jamie used, in fact still uses, an augmentative communication device called a light writer, which allowed him to, quote, both see the words and hear them in a constant voice that was always the same in speed and tone. The simultaneity stitched vision and hearing together, making each more useful. Simonis' listening therapy promoted better auditory processing of speech. According to Jamie, it gives your ear, this is a quote, it gives your ears the feeling of reaching the bridge over the missing meaning of sounds. It helped, he said, with both distinction and connection. Heavily patterned classical music adapted to emphasize high-frequency overtones at targeted moments and shifting strategically from ear to ear is thought to aid the listener in taking in the full auditory spectrum and processing it more efficiently. Suddenly, Jamie could hear, quote, whole words. Before, he commented, I would lose certain sounds and the words seemed as garbage to be thrown out with no use to them. Other therapies focused on his proprioception or the awareness of his body in space. Not only is there demonstrable dysfunction in the brain's motor areas in classical autism, but also the two cerebral hemispheres don't communicate as well as they might. Therapies like neurological drumming and figure eight movements on a rope swing facilitate midline crossing, which in his case, work to integrate the two sides of his body. With the former, the patient alternates hitting a drum with his left and right hands as the clinician moves the drum and forces him to reach on a diagonal. These therapies, Jamie contended, quote, gave me faster speed in typing with both hands and helped me to organize my body when I cut food, ate, shaved, and washed my hair. Basic improvised accommodations made a difference as well. Quote, in elementary school, beanbag seats, rocking chairs, headphones with music, net swings, and being squeezed between two mats in the physical therapy room allowed me my upsets, he wittily explained, but never the request to leave the school. To make lunch bearable, he would collect his loaded tray at the entrance of the cafeteria, having ordered it in advance, and thereby avoid, quote, the ordeal of looking at and smelling all the many foods. Although he lamented eating by himself in a quiet place, he knew that he had to manage stress. Henry David Thoreau, that paragon of primitive solitude, once remarked of his aversion to comfortable urbanity, I would rather sit on a pumpkin and have it all to myself than be crowded on a velvet cushion. He too had his quirks and some believe may have been on the spectrum. Or as one of Aesop's fables advises, better to eat a crust in peace than to partake of a banquet in anxiety. Some of these accommodations fell away as Jamie grew older, others took their place. When he matriculated to Syracuse University, which was just a short drive from his house, he had to acquaint professors with the sort of needs most had never encountered before. Jamie is thought to be only the eighth or ninth student with classical autism ever to earn a college degree. For one thing, he had a classroom aide as he did in elementary, middle, and high school. The aide helped him to remain on task, oversaw his augmentative communication devices, and studied with him. For another, he frequently stimmed in class. This allowed him to vent nervous energy and paradoxically to take in the lecture. Albert Einstein once quipped a man who can drive safely while kissing a pretty girl is simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves. <laughs> in autism, however, the postures of attention are different. Uh, the, the ardent moving of lips, as it were, can facilitate, I mean, driving can facilitate, as it were, the ardent moving up movement of lips. Really, I think my stims may help my management to absorb information at times, Jamie has said. Because anxiety often inhibited word retrieval and rendered auditory processing difficult, he made sure that his professors didn't leap to conclusions about his ability. I feel stronger when you get to know me and my autism. Your knowledge is my power, he explained. If he struggled to respond to a question, it wasn't necessarily because he didn't know the answer or was like other distracted or hungover college students. Jamie much preferred a classroom with windows 
and he wished to sit near natural light rather than in, quote, the middle of the crush of desks, end quote. He asked his professors not to speak too quickly and requested that course materials be available in alternative formats so that he could both see and hear them. Fairly typically, he needed extra time on tests, but he also needed them in a larger font, and he wanted to take tests in a private room so as to be able to read them aloud to himself. In labs, he needed a stereo head, what Jamie called a dual-eyed microscope, and time to do the labs alone. His motor impairments made the process excruciatingly slow, and he didn't want the other students to have to wait for him. About inclusion, the young man with a chin-strap beard and auburn hair was at once starry-eyed and pragmatic. Certainly students like me struggle at times, but when we struggle, I see the lowering of expectations, Jamie remarked at an autism conference in Vermont in 2013. I've been truly fortunate with people who respect me and try to help my success as a student. Passionate, creative ways are sometimes necessary." He, end quote. He was especially appreciative of teachers who believed in his, quote, potential as a true possibility. I am not planning a segregated life for myself, he told the audience, but, quote, our bodies need support in order to live in the world, end quote. Speaking directly to educators, he pleaded, do not just give us the desk, then leave us to only fill the seat. We are, we are certainly worth your efforts. At the same time, he fully acknowledged the disabling aspects of autism, which couldn't always be circumvented, and he knew his own sensory limits. I am greatly perplexed when I see young student systems being overwhelmed, trying to be what is normal, he warned. This, the, the summer before my son DJ embarked on his own college adventure, he asked Jamie about living in the dorm. Not a chance, he replied. It's too long in the day. It was all he could do to keep it together from nine to five. He needed to be able to return from campus at night to the familiar space and rituals of home. For him, autism was, quote, a balance straddling the gulf between what is desired and what is. But lest you hear too much resignation in that statement, consider the fact that Jamie desired to speak, and at the age of 13, to the astonishment of many an expert, including Albert Galliberta at Harvard, he accomplished this feat. As a small child, he'd been taught to type on a keyboard using that much maligned technique called facilitated communication. With FC or supported typing, the person with autism is offered resistance at the hand, elbow, or shoulder as he manipulates a keyboard. Eventually, Jamie learned how to type independently and then started to speak what he pecked out two fingers at a time like an oil field pump jack or thirsty bird as that contraption is sometimes called. I decided to take a risk and began to try just one word he recounted. I know my voice sounded foolish, but it felt okay to try. The voice is a wild thing, Willa Cather wrote. It can, can't be bred in captivity. It is a sport like the silver fox. It happens. And yet Jamie's voice was indeed bred in captivity. When I was growing up, I could see the words in my brain, he recalled, but they died as soon as they were born. What made me feel angry was that I knew exactly what I was to say, and my brain was retreating in defeat. An innovative occupational therapist used a range of movement therapies, including rhythmic drumming and a metronome, to mechanically coax a voice from Jamie's fingertips. At first, he could only speak while typing. Then he could only read aloud something that he himself had typed, the memory of having produced the words with his fingers somehow guiding his mouth. Now he can read aloud another person's text and even speak without first typing what he wants to say. It's about a five to seven year journey from the first moments of speaking while typing. When he's nervous, however, as I mentioned, he still prefers to prime his voice motorically. This is the journey I am on, Jamie told the Vermont conference audience, from a boy in his tender years with no voice to a boy who could begin to find his voice and formulate useful language. It has taken many, many people who presumed me to be competent and who held my dreams, he said gratefully. 
I recount the story of Jamie's eggplant or green pepper response to adversity because the novel we read together by Skype, Leslie Marmon Silko's Ceremony, features a protagonist who must similarly find his way to health. Not health in the strict, narrow Western medical sense, but in the much broader Native American sense, where an individual's illness or dysfunction can only be healed in relation to the health of his or her community. Of the protagonist, Teo, the medicine man, Batoni says, the becoming must be cared for closely. This becoming turns out to be a rich sensory motor odyssey, one that Jamie could very much relate to. His own sensory motor odyssey began at the Juonio School in Syracuse, an institution devoted to the principle of inclusion. In the language of the Haudenosaunee, a group of Native American tribes in the Northeast and Great Lakes area of the U.S., Juonio means to set free. I was a little boy with luck, Jamie recalled, because Juonio was a joyous place of community. For those unfamiliar with the plot of Ceremony, let me try to sketch it out a little more for you. Published to great acclaim in March of 1977, Ceremony tells the story of a World War II veteran of mixed Laguna, Pueblo, and white ancestry who returns from combat in the Philippines with a severe case of battle fatigue, or what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. After convalescing for a period at a VA hospital, Teo travels to the impoverished Laguna Reservation in New Mexico, where his aunt and grandmother reside, still haunted by the death of his cousin Rocky during the infamous Bataan Death March of 1942. He had promised to look after Rocky, whose head a Japanese soldier had sadistically cracked in two. Western medicine fails to help Teo, who, like many Native Americans, was encouraged to leave the old customs behind in favor of the material promises of assimilation. In his case, he joined the army. The novel tracks Teo's agonizing descent into alcoholism and destructive behavior as he fleetingly recalls through his grandmother and the New Mexico landscape itself a long forgotten way of relating to the world. Eventually, the ministrations of the mixed race medicine man, Batoni, and a phantom woman or spirit figure bring about Teo's recovery. That recovery coincides with the return of rain to the drought-plagued reservation. At the end of the book, he completes a ceremony that, quote, restores harmony with his natural surroundings and with his people, as Silko once remarked in an interview. Considered by some to be the first Native American novel by a woman, ceremony, in the words of Larry McMurtry, quote, has been startling and moving readers in their thousands for more than a quarter century. End quote. It isn't, however, your typical novel, not by a long shot. The native writer N. Scott uh, Mamaday has labeled it a telling because it is so filled with and shaped by the mythic creation stories of tribal culture, which is a distinctly oral as opposed to print phenomenon. The book also seems to present a native version of magical realism, one that paradoxically amplifies the gritty verisimilitude of reservation life, while also making palpable the living force of the Laguna past and land. Some scholars have read the novel as an early and powerful ecological statement. Others have called the land, which has been contaminated by nuclear testing, the novel's primary storyteller. As I mentioned earlier, I decided to discuss ceremony with Jamie because he had minored in Native American studies at Syracuse. At the time, I was aware of, but did not fully apprehend his interest in the subject, an interest that predated his college years. As he pointed out to me, his hometown sits, quote, on native lands, but most don't know it. End quote. He loved to read about the different Indian nations, both in school and on his own. A favorite teacher who, quote, felt the sadness and dear destruction, end quote, exposed him to the history of conquest. She also exposed him to Native American creation stories, unleashing a veritable obsession, what the typical, typical autism expert would term, without irony, a restricted interest. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing how um, an interest like this could be somehow read pathologically. It's not amazing. I've been experiencing it for 25 years. Looking back, Jamie said, 
I simply love the idea of the earth as the valuable essence of life. I feel comfortable in this culture. He especially appreciated contemporary efforts at tribal rebirth, what he called, quote, developing the hope of living in liberation after being devastated in fundamental life, end quote. At Syracuse, he was able to take a number of classes with Native American professors, and he was pleased by, quote, the respect he received as a learner, end quote. He felt not only welcomed, which is rare enough in inclusive education, but also treasured. I have noticed, Jamie wrote, that in the study of the Native Americans, there seems to be a calling for demonstrating the life worth of all communities of people, whether they are the nations of the Haudenosaunee, Iroquois, or Mohawk, or communities of people who struggle with communication, motor dysfunction, or sensory regulation. Everyone deserves to be valued just for being the humans they are. Imagine a philosophy so organically accepting that it didn't need the contemporary concept of neurodiversity to honor people who are cognitively different. This is the context in which Jamie and I read and discussed ceremony, roughly 20 pages a week for 12 weeks. In him, I had a partner who knew much more about Native American culture than I did and who intensely identified with the novel's protagonist. He also brought a different kind of brain to the encounter, which proved to be an unmitigated boon. A Native American professor at Syracuse had once described Jamie's writing as dreamy. There was indeed something to this description, but the Brigadoon quality often seemed more diagrammatic than pictorial, more math than mist. Imagine a kind of divine, whoops. Imagine a kind, oh there, of divine geometry, all manner of shapes floating in the air. The cathedral of life renders a set of three-dimensional plans. An aficionado of complex symmetry, Jamie attempted to translate his formidable spatial perceptions, which are gov governed largely by the right cerebral hemisphere, into language which is governed largely by the left, with all of the syntactical and usage challenges this entailed. For example, he called the business of talking about how a book intersects with our lives dimensional truth. Laguna chants were harmonies of elevation. Human voices carry visual form. Ceremonies, quote, can structure visual connection with the grounding of the past, end quote. When he liked something I said, he would respond with cool as ice or highly structural. There was no greater compliment he could give than to appreciate an entity's essential organization. In The Autistic Brain, a recent book, uh, Temple Grandin provides a clue as to what may be going on. Whereas in her groundbreaking work, Thinking in Pictures, she simply conceived of neurotypicals as verbal thinkers and autistic thinkers as visual ones, in this book she ruffles the binary in order to account for autistics who are verbal thinkers and autistics who are visual thinkers but in ways very different from herself. What I call the picture thinker, she reports, the new research called an object visualizer. And what I called a pattern thinker, it called a spatial visualizer. Grandin excelled at the former, but was surprisingly poor, indeed awful, at the latter. Spatial visualizers can manipulate objects in their heads, moving them at will in a kind of organic calculus, as though they were determining the volume of a solid of revolution without equations. Grandin can see the objects in astonishing detail, but to map them, she must move around the object herself as though she were holding a video camera. Neuroimaging has shown that there are two visual pathways in the brain, the ventral, which handles the appearance of objects, and the dorsal, which handles the position and relation of objects in space. As Grandin notes, people obviously use both pathways, relying more on one or the other depending on the task. But in autism, a particular path may be dominant, exceedingly so. In the 1920s, a German psychologist noted that hallucinations from drugs, migraines, flickering lights, and other causes took one or more geometric forms, tunnels, spirals, lattices, or cobwebs. 
In the 1980s, a mathematician at Caltech hypothesized that, quote, because hallucinations moved independently of the eye, the source of the images was not on the retina, but in the visual cortex itself. In other words, the hallucinations were a reflection of the fractal geometry that undergirds functional sight, a geometry that turns out to be ubiquitous in nature. When you hallucinate, you see seeing. It's quite possible that in autism, where bottom-up processing is the norm, space, autistic spatial visualizers behave a bit like a computer, a natural one, synthesizing and manipulating visual information to, to discover the living essence of objects in space. They see an object, at least initially, the way that a dorsally driven visual cortex and not the eye in service to the frontal lobes would see it. Increasingly, Jamie believed that the novel welcomes an autistic neurology. While ceremony obviously presents a story, it dramatizes space, not time, the customary engine of narrative. In fact, it does away with the latter altogether, or at least its unidirectional version, because it has come to signify inexorable ruin. At one point in the novel, as Teo searches for some cattle that white ranchers have stolen, he muses, Quote, the ride into the mountain had branched into all directions of time. Rocky and I are walking across the ridge in moonlight. This night is a single night, and there has never been any other, end quote. By treating time as space, Teo begins to escape the iron logic of loss. He experiences the fullness of the past through something like radical stereopsis or depth perception. The image of Rocky gestures at unseen dimensions, including the four worlds below, where the spirits of the dead reside, and the space of mythological figures such as Corn Mother and Thought Woman. When I inquired as to why Silco interrupts the story with native legends and poems, Jamie, Re Jamie replied, through the poems, memories and ceremonies are slowly returned to Teo's mind. They are the voices of the past seeking connection to the present. They exist outside of the novel and must somehow be brought in. Teo, he remarked in a startling figure, is listening with more than ears. And Jamie, it seemed to me, was reading with more than eyes. He was using his considerable visuospatial prowess to illuminate the novel's spiritual geography. But Tony's counsel that the becoming must be cared for closely thus applies as much to the protagonist as to the reader who is asked to think like a spatial visualizer and to piece together dynamically the novel's own becoming. How would Silco understand autism, I asked, intrigued by the prospect that Jamie's affinity for Native American culture was as much a matter of cognitive style as it was hospitable feeling or political conviction. Although he certainly experienced the equivalent of what he called the Native American world of challenges, end quote, something about his own sensing lined up with what he'd encountered in his studies at Syracuse and in reading ceremony with me. Pointing to the mute boy Shush, who lives with Batoni and who is said to have been raised by bears, think of him as a native twist on the feral child, Jamie believes Silco would reject the prevailing stereotype of autistics as deeply tuned out. She would view the condition not only as a potential shamanic gift, he maintained, but also as a mark of profound connection with nature. Perhaps Shush is autistic, he speculated, in that he sees beyond the purely physical. In a conceit that reflected Silco's desire to preserve the endangered values and traditions of an oral culture in a print medium, Jamie presented autism as a kind of literacy instructor. Autism plays ideas as a mother in the reading of books, he said, meaning that the mother or earth formulates connection in the strong sense of the Indian language. I remember being perplexed by this statement, but also having a sense of what he meant. The irony of associating autism with parenting, let alone teaching, did not, however, escape me. 
Autism, according to Jamie, is at once a mother instructing her children to read and Mother Nature herself a source of interpretable, life-sustaining lessons. Literacy in this understanding becomes a way of being in the world as much as a phonological, orthographical, semantic, syntactical, and morphological technique. The book of life, as reflected in the language of the Laguna people, emerges from the land. Like Silco, Jamie refused to accept a strict dichotomy between reading and living, or between thinking and seeing. Although autism is a profoundly visuospatial intelligence, it doesn't preclude verbal ability. That should go without saying. Just as Grandin learned to express herself in language, so too did Jamie, though, though he acknowledged that the translation of the visual into the verbal continues to be frustrating. My point is that certain works of literature seem especially to reward a visuospatial intelligence. When Jamie reported that he, quote, really enjoys the strong visual emotions that Silco extends to readers, end quote, or references her, quote, words of visual courage, end quote, he could be said to confirm what cognitive scholars already know, that literature's concrete diction elicits mental imagery in the minds of readers. But when he says, I enhance the process of interpreting the patterns of language in order to demonstrate the progress of movement in the visual, or I work in the beauty of the production of image evolving in my world of interpretation, he points to something conspicuously autistic, the kind of videographic imagination that Grandin and others have talked about. Grandin's seminal book, Thinking in Pictures, I already mentioned it, begins like this. I think in pictures, words are like a second language to me. I translate both spoken and written words into full color movies, complete with sound which run like a VCR tape in my head. When somebody speaks to me, his words are instantly translated into pictures. Language-based thinkers often find this phenomenon difficult to understand, but in my job as an equipment designer for the livestock industry, visual thinking is a tremendous advantage." End quote. Jamie hasn't yet found employment that would allow him to exploit his own capacity to think in pictures, but he would agree with Grandin. My creation of visual mind is something I am passionate about, he emphasized. To him, reading literature is akin to watching a three or even four dimensional film in his head. While the typical reader seems to connect a novel's images like a primitive flip book animator, Jamie connects them like an award winning Hollywood producer. He enhances, as he says, the process of interpreting the patterns of language by giving words not only more flesh, but also more motion. Such enhancement proved especially useful when he began to explore Silco's idea of reparative becoming through ceremonial movement. Scholars of modernist literature speak of a literary technique called stream of consciousness, in which, as a common dictionary definition puts it, a character's thoughts, uh, feelings, and reactions are depicted in a continuous flow, uninterrupted by objective description or conventional dialogue." End quote. Images run into each other, like entities in a flood, lawn chairs collide with trash cans, strollers collide with bicycles. It's a constant cerebral ampersand in which the non sequitur reigns. Silco no doubt uses this technique to convey Teo's anguished state of mind, but she is finally interested in something else, something much more ambitious. She wants to convey, as Jamie helped me to understand, an evolving relationship between the land, the past, and a people, an evolution that in no way sacrifices that past or renders it defunct. Call it stream of geography or the spatial visualizer's antidote to linear history. Jamie's movie-making mind dedicated itself to the project of vitally seeing Teo's slow passage back to wholeness. In a Western context, the poet Wendell Berry remarks, the concept of health is rooted in the concept of wholeness. To be healthy is to be whole. The word health belongs to a family of words, a listing of which will suggest how far the consideration of health must carry us. Heal, whole, wholesome, hail, hallow, holy. 
Jamie was intimately familiar with this broader notion of health, which for him involved not only the many therapies and accommodations he had received, but also, and just as important, the community of sport support he had worked to establish. From that community emerged a kind of palpable spirituality. His creation of visual mind and his love of Native American culture fueled his identification with Teo, and as will become clear, it encouraged him to map his motor challenges onto Silco's hero. But first, I want to say just a bit more about Jamie's seeing. One consequence of local overconnectivity and a greater reliance on posterior sensory regions of the brain to think is a preference for details over categories and the concrete over the abstract. Jamie experienced this phenomenon as well, and it too seemed uncannily to serve the needs of the novel. Before thinking tree, for example, Burke takes in, quote, the molecular structure of the good freedom of the natural world, end quote. Details are my friends, he explained. Like a post-structuralist of the visual, he celebrates each tree's irreducible particularity, noting the wood of the forest of trees perhaps engages the brain to connect with the work of differences. The category tree and the even bigger category forest emerge slowly. I believe it's seeing the tree in the process of creation, he remarked. With this kind of seeing, the world doesn't exist in advance as something to be used or mastered. Delayed decoding, to borrow another scholar's memorable phrase in another context, facilitates extraordinary pattern detection in autism. In fact, the ability to think beneath the category is crucial for seeing how ostensibly discrete things might connect or how ostensibly linked things might connect differently. Researcher Tim Langdell found that autistics excel at pure pattern, whereas neurotypicals excel at social pattern. Pure pattern hides in plain sight. It contradicts the socially assigned and accepted meaning of things, and in this way can foster creativity. As Grandin writes, the trick to coming up with novel uses for a brick is not to be attached to its identity as a brick. The trick is to reconceive of it as a non-brick. Over the course of our discussions, Jamie's, Jamie revealed his considerable ability to sequence the pattern. The pattern is what I see in the first look, he said. I like following it. Truly, I am summoning the answers and revealing what the information connects. Unlike Grandin and some other so-called high-functioning autistics, he doesn't attribute his advanced pattering skills to a Spock-like repudiation of emotion. His seeing isn't strictly logical, however bottom-up it may be, nor is it asocial, not in the least. What Jamie describes sounds a lot like motif tracing, a staple of literary study. As a motif, as any first-year literature student knows, is a recurring image or theme that musically structures a novel, poem, or play. This structure is subtle, and it requires not only searching for it in unexpected places, but also recognizing it in unexpected forms. I took note of how Jamie had translated a non-conceptual autistic propensity to see patterns into a conceptual neurotypical one. In literature, it found a meeting point for the two processing styles. Books are patterning on thoughts, he said confidently. Ceremony makes great use of patterns, and not just in the way that a skilled author does. Rather, the ritual that restores Teo to health literally requires improved pattern detection. Teo is said to be, in, quote, involved with other things than words, memories and shifting sounds heard in the night, diamond patterns black and white, the energy of the design spiraled deep, then protruded suddenly into three-dimensional summits, their depth and height dizzy and shifting with the eye, end quote. The woman with whom he makes love wears a blanket. Teo, quote, did not miss the designs woven across the blanket in four colors, patterns of storm clouds in white and gray, black lightning scattered through brown wind, end quote. When I asked Jamie about this passage, he replied, the pattern is of the universe, and through her, he will receive the heavens of the brain. 
to be certain that I hadn't missed the import of this insight or his miraculous phrasing, he added, I mean that this pattern will open the thought to remembering what Batoni has spoken of and seen as vision. And this was a pattern in our communication. I was sort of the dummy who had to be <laughs> taught the significance of what he was saying and what he was finding in uh, Silco. In ceremony, an actual picture of, quote, the pattern of stars the old man drew on the ground that night appears suddenly. Why would a novel, which is an art form made of words, include a drawing of a constellation, I asked? It is important to reveal the vital process of emotion, especially when those stars will passionately interpret a pattern of return. To me, the drawing looks simply as a thought of pure energy, he replied. How interesting. Jamie seemed to put his finger on Silco's need at this moment for something like an autistic, which is to say visuospatial intelligence. The patterning of words alone, she hints, is inadequate. The writer's tiny graphic signifiers can't quite depict the volumetric depth or annulated shape of prophecy. The future depends, as Batoni understood, on adapting the old ways, including the transformation of oral storytelling into print narrative and vice versa. Burke called this sort of changing with the present intelligent continuation. And the phrase can be applied as much to Teo's journeying into the place of memory as to his own journeying into the place of typing and speech. For as long as I have known Jamie, I have marveled at his ability to type independently and to speak what he has typed. Jamie has distinguished himself in these and other respects, but how exactly did he do it? Consider the new sensory motor understanding of autism. This view emerged when the stranglehold of mechanistic thinking about the brain began to relax. Scientists abandoned modular notions of brain functioning, this controls that, in favor of complex networks that, that connect otherwise distinct regions in intricately patterned ways. Even the oldest, most primitive reptilian regions such as the basal ganglia and cerebellum, which had been thought to contribute narrowly to motor function, were implicated in, a higher, or, in higher order thought. Just this morning, a new study came out that said only 20% of the cerebellum is actually devoted to movement, that 80% of it is devoted to higher order uh, functions. I mean, that's absolutely stunning, right? I mean, the degree to which we're rethinking the brain. The basal ganglia enable voluntary motor actions, where the, whereas the cerebellum ensures coordination, precision, and accurate timing. It's a crude definition. In fact, Gerald Edelman coined the phrase basal syntax to emphasize the fundamental relationship between movement and language. As Marcel Kinsbord once argued, language is, quote, an elaboration, extension, and abstraction of sensory motor function. It evolved from, quote, utterances that were coincident with and driven by the same rhythm as the movement in question. End quote. Or as Ian McGilchrist put it more recently, the deep structure of syntax is founded on the fixed sequences of limb movement in running creatures. End quote. These, reachers, these researchers point to the fully integrated and embodied nature of human cognition. It is neither modular in its operation nor cut off from the flesh. Indeed, the brain depends on a body, a very active body, to think. Over the last five or six years, really now seven, the scientific literature has confirmed what autistics, parents, and clinicians have known for quite some time, that, quote, ASD is associated with significant and widespread alterations in motor performance, as a meta-analysis from 2010 concluded. This study went so far as to propose that motor differences, particularly in the basal ganglia and cerebellum, constitute a, quote, core element of autism and that interventions aimed at improving motor coordination, gait and balance, arm functions and movement planning should be developed. Analyzing the movements of typical toddlers, Elizabeth Torres discovered that three-year-olds quote, do not yet have statistical predictability of temporal features of their limb movements. It is not only that they lack the control and motor fluency of four-year-olds, but also that their movements are still conspicuously random. There's too much noise 
and too little signal as they respond with their bodies to a moving and endlessly variable world. Even when they attempt to produce the same movement, the movement is different. That's the point. The organism must be able to adapt spontaneously to the demands of the present, which in all of its swirling specificity only vaguely resembles the moment just before it. These toddlers haven't yet assimilated what the philosopher Maria Brinker and Torres called sensory motor priors, a sturdy probabilistic expectation about the variability itself. In this key respect, classical autistics operate motorically like typical three-year-olds. For both, as probabil probabilistic expectation offers little guidance, perception and movement stall like a stunt plane whose angle of attack has exceeded maximum lift. They remain immured in mesmerizing intensity, not propelled by the customary procedures, the flight plan of temporal abstraction. For this reason, another researcher, Pat Amos, argues that autism should be considered a temporospatial processing disorder akin to Parkinson's syndrome. She writes, quote, it is often observed that the sense of time appears to work differently for many people with autism. That would not be surprising given the increasing evidence that autism involves challenges to neural connect connectivity and different ways of assembling experiences. What has to be connected in order to accurately sense time is something even more complicated than, for example, connecting speech sounds with facial movements. Time is not a mode or channel of sensory experience, but an amodal property that unites the perceptions of different senses. We sense time through comparisons of our experiences, bootstrapping from events of known duration to establish expectations about other events. Repeated events in the world and familiar rhythms of the body come to stand in for intervals of time with which new events can be compared." End quote. Amos concludes, if these embodied experiences are unreliable for people in the autism spectrum, it might make sense that the comparison process also would prove challenging, resulting in a panicked feeling of being adrift in a sea of time. So my son, who, who graduated from Oberlin, he still needs picture schedules to map out every single day. The immense things, as smart as he is, unbelievably smart, there's just tremendous anxiety about not being able to anchor him at a particular moment in time. And without the visual, I could write down, here's what we're going to do today. There's just extraordinary anxiety. Enter the drum and metronome. We know that auditory rhythm not only activates a person's motor systems, but there is, quote, evidence of rapid motor synchronization to an external rhythmic cue in persons with and without neurological disability, end quote. As anyone who's ever attended a dance or tapped their fingers to a song on their iPod knows, I know the iPod reference dates me, a particular beat can physiologically commandeer our bodies, prompting us to move in concert with it. Scientists call this phenomenon entrainment, and it has far-reaching implications for rehabilita rehabilitative interventions. Research has demonstrated that auditory rhythmic cueing offers, quote, a temporal template for the organization of motor output. It affects both, quote, the timing of movement and the total movement pattern by adding stability and motor control immediately within two or three stimuli rather than through gra a gradual learning process. This is huge, right? You don't have to teach somebody this, this phenomenon of entrainment. By influencing motor anticipation, the listener's response pattern gradually becomes automatized. In this way, such cueing can compensate for dysfunction in the basal ganglia or cerebellum and perhaps even encourage cortical plasticity. The cerebellum has been shown to aid in, quote, computing the temporal parameters of incoming sensory stimuli and outgoing movements as well as in novel, temporally precise motor movements. It is the organic comparator of which Amos spoke. Quote, it predicts the timing of an uh, upcoming movement, utilizes sensory feedback from the current movement, compares ongoing performance to an internal model, and then adapts responses such as force and or trajectory, end quote. 
like a kind of motorized auditory wheelchair, rhythmic cueing can move the struggling autist along. It can do much of the work of sensory motor priors. In the chapter on Tito, he uses, he, he says that William Blake taught him how to tie his shoes. He used a poem with tetrameter, wrapped it around his fingers, and at 17, mastered that act. He also uses uh, very regular pentameter. He's not a fond of a lot of fond of a lot of metrical substitutions. Very regular pentameter in the background, the way some people use TV. It is his calming. Listen all day to metrical poetry, as a as a, and it it, it it takes away that sense of of being lost in time and and actually facilitates motor performance. Neurological drumming and a metronome helped Jamie to type independently and eventually to speak. Simonis listening therapy helped him to tie his shoes. So many things were hard for me to learn, he reported. Um, about that latter milestone, tying shoes, which he'd achieved at, he, at age 15, he said, my brain moved into hiding the reason for not being able to do it. Like saying letters, mostly there was no pattern to follow in my brain for tying my shoelaces. After much practice, it seemed a pattern moved into my brain, giving directions to my hands, end quote. By pattern, Jamie means something like a path or continuum, a kind of impetus that helps to string a series of motor actions together. His body needed the conviction of a moving sidewalk at the airport or a bowling ball that's kept out of the gutter by bumpers. Momentum and direction driving intentionality forward and instilling confidence. The authors of an important study write, building an anticipatory means of motor control in autism might facilitate the development of internal models for motor planning. This seems to be what happened with Jamie. He doesn't need the metronome to converse. Whereas typical children move from speech to literacy, this is the Iowa Public Radio show, he's actually in Syracuse, in the station in Syracuse. It was super complicated setup because uh, we have people all over the place. Um, whereas typical children move from speech to literacy by connecting the sounds they produce with ease to the graphic marks on a page, Jamie moved in the opposite direction by connecting the graphic marks on his light writer to the sounds coming out of the synthesizer. It's seeing and hearing together, Jamie had once told an interviewer. The light writer served as prompt and model, the metronome as an external motor planning device. With his eyes in effect, being asked to move his tongue, and his ears, in effect, being asked to move his limbs, he jerry-rigged a voice. Aggressive auditory visual and auditory motor coupling overwhelmed the considerable obstacles to speech. As I said, it for, uh, as I said at first, Jamie could speak only while, while typing. Then he could read aloud only something that he had typed, not other printed matter. This aspect of Jamie's journey continues to intrigue me. How can motor memory in one domain, typing, facilitate motor performance uh, in another, speech? A recent study revealed, I had to find a CD in my car and take an iPhone <laughs> picture of it. A recent study revealed that listening to unfamiliar music activates the listener's motor systems. Even more interesting, the interstices between songs on a familiar CD do the same. The researchers hypothesize that motor areas support sequential mastery and in the process provide a memory boost. This is why we all know which song is coming next on our favorite CD before it starts. It is as if our motor systems create an essential continuum by constantly anticipating. We might even say by constantly remembering the future. They listen in Jamie's phrase with more than ears. They listen when technically there is nothing to listen to and in so doing provide, again in Jamie's phrase, intelligent continuation. I think that's what that metronome and, uh, and, the, and the pentameter are doing. Perhaps Jamie's tongue and voice box moved with more than arms. Perhaps in perfect stillness, they remembered how to talk. Carol Welch once commented, movement is a medicine for creating change in a person's physical, emotional, and mental states, end quote. It is also a way of uniting people. 
A study from last year pointed to yet another benefit of auditory rhythmic cueing. It confirmed that, quote, having listened to a rhythmic beat, individuals' movements become more aligned to the frequency of that beat, end quote, and even more important that, quote, when alignment to the rhythmic stimulus occurs in two interacting individuals, manifesting as increased motor coupling, their interpersonal attitudes toward one another become more positive. Here we have the very basis of Native American community, the social bonding through ritual that neurologically knits people together. In this context, prophecy is less an actual prediction than a holistic sense of how the body moves in the world. There were transitions that had to be made in order to become whole again, but Tony explains. We might think of these transitions as akin to the gaps or interstices in a complex motor task. Call what is required to navigate them spiritual priors. Teo needs a sense of time that is at once productively spatial and linear. In touch with the spirit world, the former rejects the so-called ruin of native history. The latter insists on pushing forward. The future will not be worth living if it cannot be remembered motorically. A line from one of the poem chants that interrupts the novel proclaims, I am walking back to belonging. And Teo himself is described as wanting to walk until he recognized himself again. At the end of the novel, as he moves ceremonially through the landscape with the woman who has drawn him out of traumatic remem remembrance, we are told, every step formed another word. Movement is language, a fully embodied and embedded narrative of healing. There is simply no point in talking about native recovery apart from the body or place of belonging. The ear for the story and the eye for the pattern were theirs, the novel declares. The feeling was theirs. We came out of the land and we are hers. As we read Ceremony together, Jamie saw in Teo's story his own story of coming to life through speech. The ability to speak with voice curiously created many new patterns of access, he noted. Understanding his own progress as a mover in physical, mental, and spiritual terms, Jamie said, we are just people on the transition, Ralph. Harmony for me is all structural realities and great worlds connecting with people and dimensions to create peace and calm and engagement of hearts and minds, which then move in the dear success of lovely life. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions. Yes. Um, thank you so much. This was such an amazing talk. Um, there's so much I could ask, but I, I wanted to maybe frame my question by asking you, there's at least maybe like sort of three sets of discourses that you have in play here, one of which is literary literature, discor literary discourse, another of which is kind of the discourse of the autistic people that you're reading alongside with themselves, and then a third would be like cognitive neuroscience. And I'm curious how, in, and this is sort of like a question about your own method, like how do you sort of like keep all of those in play without letting one come to dominate perhaps, or do you, do you see one? Because it seems to me that there's a kind of tension, perhaps, of, of sort of referring to the kind of authority of the neuroscience in some ways. Um, and I'm just curious how you kind of like think about that in relationship to some of the questions that like autistic communities are thinking about in relationship to that. So, so really terrific um, question. Um, first thing I would say is that um, there's good neuroscience and bad neuroscience. I mean, just like there's good literary study and bad literary study and uh, literary criticism. So. I, I first don't start with the proposition that some of my colleagues in the humanities do with that all science is bad or suspect or needs is needs to be ideologically demolished. That's the first thing. The second thing I would tell you, um, this is personal to me. In other words, I had to solve problems that no one else was even interested in solving because they had a very different idea of autism that didn't square with the lived reality of raising my son and knowing so many other autistic people. 
So as all of that's happening, I'm teaching myself neuroscience. I'm, I'm, I'm rubbing it up against my lived reality and I'm teaching all sorts of autistic kids. My wife's teaching them. We're doing this inclusion thing. I'm, I'm learning politically about the battles to inclusion. I've got all of this stuff. I've got this stuff. Meanwhile, some very progressive uh, neuroscientists are starting to hire autistics as researchers on their team. So think, for example, of Michelle Dawson on, on Laurent Motron's team at the University of Montreal. She's the first author and really maybe the most important study about intelligence and autism of the last 25 years, totally overturning what the conventional logic was. So, so I don't know how I do it. Um, no one really knows what this is. <laughs> I mean, you know, my own president jokes about, he's in the English department. Um, I mean, I do, I do more traditional stuff, um, but it was very important in this project to take the, the impulse and obligations of ethno ethnography as seriously as humanly possible. I gave you so much Jamie at the beginning. I even feared, or people going, why is he giving us, what, what, where, where's the theoretical stuff, what's happening, why are we hearing all of this stuff? Um, and I have so much, I mean, this is years of, of cataloging this stuff and thinking about it and then running it back, running it by them and constantly correcting. The no good English professor isn't just a sly joke because I also dramatize moments uh, where I get things wrong or where I make mistakes. And I'm really interested in that process of how do we interact with and conceive of the other. Um, especially if, if the other is is very different in a range a range of ways. Um, writing, I've been doing this kind of writing for a long time. I'm really really thankful that I landed at a small liberal arts college that didn't know enough to say this wouldn't count for tenure. Because I really have this fear that at, uh, other institutions. I think my first book is. You know, people think of it as creative writing, but I really think it is as theoretically informed. I mean, I really think about uh, things that um, our last wonderful speaker said about working outside the, the sort of dominant box. And I do think Grinnell allowed me some room to do that. I, it's, talk to me more about, I'm really interested in this question. Yes, Priscilla, Priscilla! Priscilla, like Deborah, was so nice to me the year and a half that I was here. How many meals did we have? Hundreds of meals. Anyway. You cooked most of them. I did. Um, I just want to <laughs> challenge what you just said a little bit. Um, I think you very much belong in an English department because your approach, your methodology, is very centered on thinking about um, image, language, narrative, and how information circulates through those things, which is how I define an English department I, I agree these with days. you. I mean, I was, I was three quarters serious. If you look at the next generation of people in this field, yeah. this, is, this is very recognizable for them. And the reason awesome. I think that's important to say is, well, first of all, people like you pioneering it, but, but also because I think that we are, the whole academy is in transition, yeah. and it's in transition in part because we're taking seriously voices like the ones you're talking about yeah. as, you know, yeah. for what they have to tell us about the world. And that is changing the way we all think about the world, yeah. which is pushing our disciplines into new and exciting directions. Could and I'd love us, to hear you, you. come up here and I will sit there. That was beautiful. <laughs> no, I would just love to hear you claim that and celebrate I, that. I, I, That's I, all. I will. I, I, some, I mean, Grinnell is both wonderful and there, there's also this, couldn't you just teach the intro to lit class and just please, you know, teach a Shakespeare. I mean, I'll do it, but, the, you know, sometimes people don't want you to obliterate their, you know. The things that that you said in a talk you gave here a few years ago was that this is returning you to some of the it poets that is. we've forgotten it and is. it's making you take things like rhythm yes. and meter more yes. seriously and there is there's an upsurge in interest in people like longfellow yes. and that was one yes. of the things you said and what longfellow is trying to do and the way he's engaging myth and the way he's engaging yes. the world and that also i mean i paid her it, yeah. <laughs> well no seriously if blake taught somebody to tie his shoes, doesn't that tell us something really profound about poetry and, and about life? And about the humanities. I mean, this is, where I, this is where I will say yes. we are Thank unbelievably you. relevant. 
um, in terms, we have no idea what literature can do, still. Yeah. That, absolutely. I think there was a hand back here. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go, please, you go, 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 go. I just didn't see you. Uh -huh. Bad left eye. I, um, I really deeply appreciated this ethnographic dive into Jamie's story, but earlier on in the uh, uh, symposium, you mentioned how there is the, uh, a diversity within the autistic community, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about some of the other perspectives that you had and how um, neurodiversity can intersect with race in particular and yes. thinking more about autistic autistics of color and what your experience was working with those folks and just giving, uh, I guess, space for that yeah. in the symposium. Yeah, it's re really terrific um, question. So the first thing I didn't really get into is, um, so the, the book, you, you hear all of these from all of these folks, then you hear from Temple Grandin. And only in the last five years did a study come out that began to distinguish between autism and alexithymia. Alexithymia is the condition where you don't recognize, can't label, or maybe not even aware of your own feelings. And uh, people used to think that, that all autistic people were alexithymic. They're not, not even by a long shot. There are more people with alexithymia, uh, alexithymia in autism than in the population at large in so much as that's what we're told currently. But my point is, at first I thought this book was gonna push back really hard on the idea that autistics are without emotion. If anything, the five before Grandin are really coping with profound emotion and controlling, controlling that emotion. When I got into the project, I really discovered all sorts of other differences. I, I mentioned one here. Um, Grandin is an object visualizer and Jamie is a spatial visualizer. As a spatial visualizer, he opened up um, Silco's novel in a way that I don't think an object visualizer would have been able to do as gloriously. So, so there are all sorts of differences we could talk about there. In the chapter on Eugenie Belkin, she is black, uh, Latino, Asian, Jewish, deaf, and autistic and fluent in sign language and worked as a ballerina, and is in the, for a while, all white world of ice skating that's a little less white, you know, each, each passing, passing year. What was astonishing about, um, about uh, Eugenie was working through some studies, we read them together, neuroscientific studies on uh, how monoracial people perceive multiracial people and the kind of identity constraint where we, we are not, we are so committed to the speed of judging somebody as black or Latino or gay or whatever it is that we are not prepared to accommodate that much complexity. And one of the things we did with these studies was link them to, I mentioned Laurent Motron. Motron's work really has nicely shown the degree to which bottom-up thinkers see so much detail that the universal or the general is a category that is very unstable and it emerges late in the game after all of these things have been looked at. Um, so Tito coming into a classroom, or Jamie even, I mean, my son had to see this room yesterday. He had to come this afternoon to see it so that he can hope to be calm tonight in the talk back for the film. He can't just jump and say, okay, this is a little weird. It's got some wood beams, but there are chairs and there are people, all the palaver of academics. It's a, it's a classroom. He, he can't do that. And so what, what Eugenie helped me to see, and really all of these folks just were amazing tutors for works that I thought I knew well, was the way in which a kind of autistic perception delays that automatic labeling of social, racial, ethnic difference enough, it hasn't been tested yet, that I wonder whether, Eugenie thinks autistic people don't make these kinds of judgments that quick because they're laboring so hard and they start from the position of seeing somebody as unique. So if you start there, then thinking about racial history is less a top-down um, project than a bottom-up project that starts filling things in. Um, there's a ton to say about that, and, and that chapter is pretty, pretty um, complex. She really loathed the novel, loathed, um, loathed the deaf characters. I mean, I think she, I mean, she really was upset 
with Carson McCullers. Yeah, because she, she thought that um, she was most intrigued by the trans character and thought that was sort of innovative, but she was so tired of the um, this sort of stereotypical accounts, even of the labor organizer or, or um, the African-American doctor who reads philosophy but doesn't understand it. So there, there, were, there, were, there were racist problems with this book. At the same time, it was responded to very favorably by many significant African-American intellectuals. They didn't have much to go. I mean, how many white people were writing even marginally progressive things about race at that time in, in, uh, in novels? Um, she's such a wonderfully feisty uh, reader. Her issue um, cognitively is, any, and she really believes it is the thing that prevented her from getting to the highest levels of ballet, was she can't hear instructions from, let's say, a choreographer that are verbal and translate them into spatial movements. Many of us can't do that, but she really can't do it. And that is a, and she would have to overcome that deficit or problem by memorizing routines to a degree you, you just couldn't imagine. She sort of mapped ballet back onto reading this book and was more intrigued by the, the fugue-like musical structure, but was really uninterested in the characters and offended. But marvelous in the way that she talked about being annoyed. It was great. I want, I want something. I, if I walked into a class and, with, and Grinnell students, this is the worst goddamn book ever. That's so much better than. I, I didn't do a very good job with your question. I, I know it, but we can talk more. Yeah. So my question takes us a little bit back to the disciplinary uh, terrain point, but I want to ask it somewhat differently, that clearly there's a lot of work being done on autism and a number of different fronts. And so I'm interested in two things. One is, you know, what kind of feedback loops or communication is across these barriers? But secondly, I'm particularly interested in how, since there's you know, progress or new discoveries or at least new viewpoints from all these different points of view, how they're feeding back into changing pedagogies? Yeah, wow. Um, so um, I, think, I think the autism research world is changing very, very quickly. I think some of the teams that have used, Dora's on a team as an autistic person with working with Christina Nicolaitis at Portland State University, and they've had some incredible studies that have almost instantaneously um, helped significantly improved access to healthcare for autistic people. Um, so I think the success of these studies has now motivated some deeply suspicious and skeptical neuroscientists. Maybe there's something to this business of including the people you're studying on their team. So I, I am seeing that. It's, it's not glacial, nor is it, you know, the 100-yard dash, but it, or the 100 meters, but I have noticed this in the last in the last 20 years. I would also say that um, I had to learn the neuroscience to a degree that I commanded the respect of someone, let's say, like Jerry Dawson, who's been terrifically supportive, who runs the Duke Autism Unit. And also, I would say that running the lab with my son, including him at Oberlin, um, and and really helped making that work. I mean, he had to do all of the work, but we had to do a lot of this infrastructural support. Um, that was monumental. Um, and this leads me to, to begin to answer your second question. I saw some of the changing pedagogies at Oberlin, simple things like DJ types very slowly. Jamie probably is the fastest typer of, of anybody you will find who types to communicate. Um, Tito types. Fat, much faster than DJ, but not, not with two fingers. So what does that mean? DJ is very sensitive to the fact that he's taking up class time with the speed of his one finger typing. So we had to choreograph the interaction with, with, with the professor. Some, ant, some questions were sent beforehand, and he could hit the button, and they would be played. He had to teach his, his professors to ask him a question. He's typing then get another, an answer or two, 
and then come back to DJ, but be prepared to integrate what DJ said, even if we sort of moved beyond it. Because initially, DJ would get pretty annoyed. He's really labored to type this thing out, and it was allowed to be played, but it didn't shape the conversation. Um, anxiety. Um, there, there had to be a wide berth for anxiety. One day in an anthro class, big anthro lecture, he, one of DJ's obsessions, if you're a woman and you're wearing pants and you have shoes with laces, the pant leg better cover the shoelaces. If I could convey to you how important this is, and how much of my life is centered around looking at women's shoes to see whether they have laces. Because he, he jumped over his aide, ran down the aisle, and adjusted the pant leg of his professor during her lecture. It's Oberlin. And so the professor's like, you're right, DJ. I love the way these pants look on a hanger, but they look terrible when, when they're on at another school with a different kind of professor, right? He came out of his Oberlin interview. I was so nervous about this because no one's expecting that kind of autism. And he, said, he types out, Dad, some of the kids here are weirder than I am. And we were, you know, I think it really, I think that helps. But also, also um, having teachers understand, as Jamie talked about, he's going to make noises. Everybody learns to overlook those noises. He's going to stim. He might get up. He might sit down. And it had benefits to the class as a whole that were discernible to the professors. But that's a start on your, on your question. Thank you so much for this for this wonderful talk. Um, I think I wanted to follow up on on a conversation that Priscilla started, and and um, also remind me of your name oh, again, Leon. Leon. Um, uh, the, sort of a, a few minutes back in the conversation, um, I was really fascinated as you spoke about your references to literary theory and literary criticism. You know, there was a line when you said, um, like a post structuralist of the visual, um, or like a first year liter literature student. And I wondered if there was a way to think about some of what was going on here, you know, towards the question of methodology as being your own experience of an archetype of an act of profound hermeneutic explication that hasn't yet been formulated within a school of literary criticism in the, in the kind that we've come to know it. And what I would cite here, um, uh, a couple things that I thought fit really beautifully, that if you're looking at Russian formalism, Vladimir Prop and Andrei Bieli are working exclusively in the frame of how to map poems. Now that works particularly well in Russian because of the stress pattern, but um, it's a, first a spatial well, my appreciation. My son wrote a, a paper on those authors at Oberlin. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. On, on this very okay. issue. So, so then I also think that, you know, Shklovsky's on the question of making the stone stony matches very nicely defamiliarization, with defamiliarization. Yeah. I, I've actually written an article with Lisa Sunshine on this. On this. So the the only thing that I would add to this is to say, um, and I, I don't mean to you know just return to return to Derrida because I know I spoke about that this morning, but the question of um, writing being primary and spacing being primary seems incredibly important yeah. to me here, and um, you know. I, I do not by any means think that Derrida is terribly clear in the explication that he gives uh, uh, of, of the question of spacing and, it, and the relationship of writing to speech and, and writing's priorness to speech. But I do think there's, there's something here in what the readers that you're reading with are experiencing that suggests the truth of that as a hermeneutic moment. And I almost want to suggest something like um, a disability hermeneutics pulling on Tobin Sieber's disability yeah. aesthetics. Yeah. I mean, this is this is great. I would say that the the book is peppered with phrases like you know post structuralist of the visual. I don't want my academic colleagues to think I'm a naive reader and entirely unaware of the ways this might be talked about. But I purposefully wrote the book in a way, to my surprise, uh, most commercial houses thought this was too difficult. Thought I was writing in an accessible way. But I real I I am sensitive to, I mean, I have 25 stranger parents write me a week. Uh, many call me on the phone, leave messages in my offices, and, 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 and I'm trying very hard to make um, the barrier uh, of entry uh, to be less significant. I think I've overstated for myself how accessible this is, but um, some of this stuff is buried. You will notice if you look at the book, the footnotes, just, there have to be 100 pages of footnotes, and you will find all of the stuff that an English professor does. Not necessarily a ton of Derrida. 
Um, but that definitely th occurred to me. I mean, not not. I mean, you elegantly uh, frame that. Um, there's a lot a lot to do here, and I'm hoping people will pick some of this stuff up. Um, I want to write a novel next. I mean, I, I've got things I want to do. Yeah. Um, thanks for such an insightful and exciting talk. Um, I want to sort of step back and ask a question about the, your, your collection of, of case studies overall. Um, I mean, now that you've written all these uh, fascinating set of studies working with your partners, could you, would you say that you could make a generalization about there being a distinctively autistic style of reading? Or are there just many examples of neurodiverse readers who all read in distinctive ways that can't sort of be lumped your, together? The question that way. is motivated um, by, <laughs> by, your own, by your own work. Um, here's what I would say. The commitment to irreducible particularity, I need, I need to constantly keep that in the forefront. Um, and so whatever generalizations I would make, I would make them the way that Temple Grandin says one should make them, although she doesn't follow her own advice. She has come to stand in as a generalization for autism and done some productive things and some very unproductive things, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Temple's been very generous to me, and I like her very much, but I do think the problem of seeing one or even six as the face of autism is troubling to me, and I think if I could, if I could live to three th the year 3000, I probably could keep doing this, and we would find some very rough generalizations or universals, but there would be so much interest in the differences. One of the things that was really moving to me was one day with Jamie, you know, his mom needs to sit in the room just to sort of calm his nerves. He's typing independently, and suddenly, you know, um, she, I could hear her gasp. She couldn't believe what the story was bringing out of Jamie and telling her about some of her son's challenges and gifts. And I, I think that was a very specific thing um, with all of the context. One of the things, I'm, I'm not one of these cognitive literary scholars that has abandoned everything else my discipline does. I really believe that setting that highly particular setting, and the fact that he is absolutely enamored of Native American history and culture, the fact that his dad was a prison guard. I didn't even tell you his dad was in the Battle of Hamburger Hill in Vietnam and survived that battle. And that was a very moving thing for, for Jamie to sort of read his dad through what had happened to Teo as well. So, I mean, I think you have to be very careful about that. Obviously, I do some of that in this book. But I'm, 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 I'm reticent about landing on, OK, we, not one type, but five. Laura Otis has, has a wonderful book about this and, and the fact that neuroscientists are following this idea. We've, done, we've gone as far as we can with generalizations about the brain in a, in a strictly neuroscientific context. We know this from cancer and immunotherapies. Why is Jimmy Carter still alive? And other people with the exact same cancer are dead in three months. Um, uh, it's now time to figure out how can we do this and uh, by being really attentive to the particular. A, a tremendous challenge, I, I, I admit. Are we good? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.